Um, first, I want to say it's a great honor no. to be doing this interview well, with you. I didn't try. I didn't dress up just for y'all, incidentally. For, no, uh, I didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere else. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I I'm just my, saying. I had the same kind of clothes y'all had on before y'all not. Yeah. <laughs> so we we really appreciate it. Um, because right. I came in freshman year, I was an honor guard. I remember taking me taking a picture with you then, and mm -hmm. um, right before you decided to retire, mm -hmm. and I took a picture with you then as well. Um, okay. And at uh, Alpha Convention, that was right out here in New Orleans. So. This is something I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Okay. Um, so uh, we took a couple of polls um, mm -hmm. from students around campus. Okay. So um, we all, we know a lot about your success and a lot of great things that you did on mm -hmm. campus in New Orleans mm -hmm. and yeah. all over outside mm -hmm. of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But we never hear um, about any of like your failures and you, something that you felt like you've learned great from mm -hmm. um, in the past. So. I feel like learning about that, you know, we can learn yeah. from it. Well, I, 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 I'm going to give you a couple of them. Okay. And, and we can take the other this way. Uh, I like to talk a little bit about the civil rights movement. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I was in the background of the civil rights movement only because uh, I was, as I said, I got married on a Monday. I mean, a, uh, on a Monday, yes, but I was drafted right after I graduated, married. I was drafted and I went in the Army as a mm -hmm. private. And I spent only the two years. So when I came back, it was 1957, mm -hmm. and uh, Rosa Park, Park said, sat on the bus in '56, mm -hmm. and and in '50, actually seven, eight, and thereof after, uh, the schools had Farber standing in the schoolhouse door, Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door in Alabama, and it was starting to warm up, and I was one of the youngest lawyers, new lo young black lawyers with Dutch Moriel mm -hmm. who came back. We were both back in 58. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Dutch joined and worked with the famous black lawyer that you should know the name and he's got a book out. His son wrote with another press called A.P. Turo Senior. Yes. He was the dean of black lawyers. Yes. He, he, and this man never made a cent. He, he did uh, civil rights cases in the 40s, that was unheard of. Mm -hmm. And I joined the uh, law firm of Collins, Douglas, and Eli. They were the core lawyers. They're mm -hmm. the ones who represented kids who sat on the uh, lunch counters. Uh, Rudy Lombard, who was a Xavier senior, mm -hmm. the head of the student body, uh, was one of the planners of the Freedom Rides. And, and what I hope to do is uh, get a plaque put on the front lawn of St. Michael's. Yeah, Cause that's that. that's where we uh, uh, housed the Freedom Riders when they came from Bessemer, Alabama. Christine, you know, Christine, 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 you know, for Christina, Kathleen, and Timmy. Yeah, and Timmy, they all went to Xavier, and they, and and Patrick went to uh, Texas. You he went to Notre Dame University, of Texas, and went to the LBJ school. And at the reception, uh, remember, remember our lady, uh, the Congress lady, who was uh, doing the the uh, uh, trial of Nixon and all that. Oh, uh, Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan taught in a graduate school. So I went to the reception for Patrick, and I'm standing. I'm number four with my wife, and they all shaking hands with Barbara Jordan. And so when it came to me, she looked at me. She said, "What you doing here?" I said, I got a son that graduated. She said, not Patrick Francis. And he was standing there. He never told me he was, <laughs> yeah, I said, none of them would ever tell you because they didn't want to be, you know, that's, I said, and that was fine with me. So in answering the question, uh, my wife, I mean, raised them every minute that I wasn't around. Now, I spent a lot of time as much as I could, and, and I can't tell. I was telling about baseball, those boys, those boys went to a small Catholic school and won the state championship. They had only 14 guys on the team, nine of them on the field and five of them on the bench. And they won the championship. They were all good ball players. Uh, she went to every basketball game, every football game. At Xavier the Barn, if, if, if somebody got hurt, like the girls, got hurt, she'd be in the locker room before the doctor got down there. <laughs> Uh, but she, she was just a firebrand, and and 
it's, it's amazing because now that I'm out, more people knew her than I thought. Because oh, yeah. after the kids were raised, uh, she got involved in... Uh, Every kind of volunteer thing. Yeah, they, As a matter of fact, the spelling bee was on campus. I said, what the hell happened? They said, the spelling bee, I said. Miss Francis, yeah. I, you know, you know, cause, cause, this, cause she, she got us involved with the, with the spelling bee. Spelling bee, she ran the spelling bee. She did everything. She, uh, she, she had a lot of energy and uh, enjoyed her children. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, the story about uh, somebody being the wings under the, the wind under your that was that was her. Yeah, the wind yeah. beneath your wing. Yeah. 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 They saw just a small picture of her, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think there's one, uh, uh, yeah, when the ball, and she walked with Joe, she, every ball. She, yeah, she was always the honorary chair of the ball. Yeah. So she, so, so she was always, I always, she always escorted me, we, we escorted each other in for the, you know, at the oh, beginning of the loved, ball. She loved, she was, uh, she taught modern dancing. That's why I met her at Xavier. She taught modern dancing and went to, uh, Ohio, was it Ohio State? Yeah, yeah, yeah went to Ohio State. But, uh, and she loved to dance. Oh yes. Now, thank God I had four boys. Mm -hmm. We'd go to gala, and she danced every dance. But I made it, well, I said, I'd say it this way. I said, okay, Michael, you, Timmy, you next, you next, and I'll take, you know, I'll take the fifth dance. <laughs> So I'd get one, one every five. <laughs> but she she would leave the she'd leave the dance floor if she danced with David. Mm -hmm. That David was the straight lace guy. He could do an impression of James Brown that you've never seen. Mm -hmm. And he was eight years old, and he he didn't forget it. So he'd get on the floor, and she thought she'd walk off the floor. Let <laughs> it be there standing. But uh, it. Uh, the best way I can explain it, I, I did a lot of things. I, 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 I'm a millionaire uh, flyer for Delta and all that. Many a nights I flew at night because I'd work all day and catch that 7 o'clock flight to New York for a meeting and the like. And, and I did this so you'll, you'll know this, and, and, it, and it took a lot of energy for a lot. But I wanted to know as a young president, I was. I was 36 when I was named president. I wanted to know who was making those tests, you know, the SAT, mm -hmm. who, who, who was distributing them. I served on the board of ETS, SAT, you name it, because I wanted to know and to be able to, and I was the only black in many of those boardrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sat around a table with the president of Georgetown, not Georgetown, he told the priest of Georgetown, Princeton, Yale, and all the rest. And I was learning, you know, I want to know everything. How y'all are doing this? Because I want to go back and make sure that we're in the right track, and we were. Uh, this lady, lady today, uh, we did Grand Opera mm -hmm. at Xavier for 25 years. And, and the, the nun who was head of it was a a member of the New York City Center Opera Company before she became a nun. So she brought it to Xavier. We did Grand Opera. Uh, uh, Annabelle Bernard, this oh. lady is writing a book about the Stearns. She was the leading mezzo-soprano in the Frankfurt Opera Company from Xavier. And the one that was a pepper pot who, who, who died young was Deborah Brown. You didn't know well, Deborah. Well, I know Deborah. Yeah, I knew her. Deborah yeah. Brown went to the New York Center Opera Company, y'all too young. There was a famous lady named Risa Stevens, and she sang Carmen, a white lady, and she got sick. <laughs> now, Deborah Brown did Carmen at Xavier, and so when she got sick, the director said, well, whoa, what are we going to do? And Deborah said, raise her hand. He said, what, what, what do you raise your hand for? She said, I, I can sing Carmen. You can sing Carmen. Where do you sing Carmen? I sang Carmen at Xavier University in Louisiana. He said, all right, put her on. Reza Stevens never sang Carmen again. again. <laughs> Deborah Brown sang him at that time. So it, 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 there'll be times when, and uh, you know, on planes, wherever I'd be going, and I met every president in the United States, starting with uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. No, John Kennedy. Who? Kennedy. 
Oh, I mean John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Jim, 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 yeah. Yeah. I met John F. Kennedy in the old French hospital building mm -hmm. he came. I met John F. Kennedy and I was involved in some part of the administrations on boards in some kind of way. And and yeah, I'm, I went to one of those famous uh, dinners that night with Blanche mm -hmm. for, for, for Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. And, and the stall short of my story is the 1964-65 Civil Rights Act would not have been passed if John and Kennedy had lived. When he was assassinated, Lyndon Johnson, who was most powerful, powerful politician in the country from Texas, he made it happen. And if you read ever the story, their stories out how he 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 wasn't sure about doing this, but all of the guys from Whitney Young, uh, Snake, uh, SCLC, all came to him and said, "You got to do this. You got to do it." And he got all those Texas folks in line, and that's how that Civil Rights Act was passed under yeah. Lyndon Johnson. And he gave that famous speech in New Orleans on the act on the war on poverty. Right. In fact right. that lady is gonna get it and send it mm -hmm. to me because you're gonna look it up. Uh, we all went to that uh, as lawyers. So that's my second answer to you. Okay. It's it you you have to gauge yourself mm -hmm. but you've gotta have people, you know, around you. Now l let me just say with on the Xavier side, uh, I inhabited a uh, institution that was top notch in 1968 when I came to the presidency. I'd seen it 10 years because I was in it, but I went to, to Xavier four years, and Xavier, Xavier was called the Black Notre Dame of the South in athletics. I mean, I, I mean, we played everything, football, track, you had, knew it. They, they used to run their big relays in Tuskegee, and on the big board would have the uh, schools that had the records, of the 15 records, Xavier had 12 of the 15 up there. But we left basketball, I mean, we left athletics in 1959 completely. Mm -hmm. And it came back when I got to be president. I brought it back because I figured that that was the history that we, sh we should, shouldn't lose. In fact, if you were at the, uh, no, that's right, the Dillard game, and I, I've got that picture, Joe, mm -hmm. with uh, Herb Douglas. Herb, Herb Douglas, right. Herb Douglas. Well, I was named president, and, and I was named president in 1968, and there were protests still going on. In fact, we had protests at Xavier, the kids were walking, you know. I had an understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, the student body president was of Ken Ferdinand. Ken Ferdinand. His brother was at Suno, and they took the flag down at Suno. His other brother was at Cornell, and there's a famous picture on a cover of Time magazine with a guy with the bullet like the Texan and a rifle, and it stood by the president at the microphone and he was there. That was the other brother, there were four brothers. He was at Cornell, uh, the, other, the other brother was at Suno, and Ferdinand was at Xavier. So when those press protests were handling, uh, Ken and I sat down and I said, look, you want, you want to do protesting, that's fine with me, and we can do it, but you can't protest and keep other students from going to class, mm -hmm. you know. You know, freedom is not free. You're free to do it, and I will respect it. But you can't uh, rock the steps and say, oh, you can't go to class. No, no, no. That, you make that choice, they make that. So we had, uh, we had a, we bought, they marched through the hallway during the break, the, the, the uh, bell break of 10 minutes. And, but I had three guys, what I got named, two, two actually, Clarence Jupiter, uh, and uh, not say Clarence Jupiter, Clarence Jupiter and Anthony Rochelle. Clarence Jupiter was the head of the anti-poverty program with two other people, uh, and he was a great writer. Uh, he grew up in the projects. Uh, he thought he was a comedian. Whenever we, we'd have something, he'd get on the stage, and, and everybody thought, "Boy!" And I said, "I'm glad you got a, a job." And, and I'll keep you, but you're not, not a comedian. But he was solid as a rock. He knew how to raise money, so he was my fundraiser. And uh, uh, Anthony Shell got his master's in building and contracting from uh, Ohio State. And so I had two guys, and I was the youngest one of the two. And uh, 
it was I had my mother's uh, temperament. I did, things didn't upset me, and I never get when they were walking in the hallways and making noise and so forth. Uh, they'd say, "I'm not sure want us to go out there and stop." No, no, let them do what they got to do. But I say when that bell rings. They know they go to class and something else because we had that understanding. Mm -hmm. So you could sit on the steps, fine. But my legal background allowed me to understand the issues of freedom and when freedom isn't free, you know. And and in I'd say this in the opening orientation. I spoke at the at orientation where uh, you you were at, at, at an orientation uh, your freshman. Okay, yeah, right. because had had we had the orientation before Katrina hit? Yes. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 yeah, right. Uh -huh. we, we had classes for one week. One yeah, week. Yeah, that's right, right. That's right. And I would I would stand up and you know give the Xavier story and what we do, how we do it, and all that. And I talked about freedom, not free. And people would look at each other, and and the legal side of me would say, "Let me tell you something. You can't walk into a theater and say fire." Your butt's gonna be in jail tomorrow morning. So mm -hmm. your right to speak, you better, you know, know when to speak, when not to speak, and the rest. And I'd lay it all out and I'd say, you know, we're gonna protect you, but let's have an understanding. Hear the rules and the like. And and we're not running prison, but we're running an opportunity where everybody will get a chance to learn, to study, and so forth. And, and I had, Joe, you weren't there, but, and there's a picture somebody sent me. When I met in the old barn, I had the whole student body in there. And all the all the leading activists were sitting around the stage, just the stage, and I'm up there with the microphone by myself. And all the and I could name them. They were all standing around there. I said, "Well, let's let's have an understanding about what and how we're going to do this." And and I said, "When we close the when we open these doors to leave, we're not going to have anybody causing a problem that'll keep anybody else." Respecting them, so, and they were involved in the, in the movement, they, and they sat on the lunch counters and the rest. Uh, I used to spend not a lot of time, but I would go to night coat because Xavier guys would leave St. Michael's or Edwards Hall, right, and catch the bus right on Washington, go to the Tivoli Theater, and now it's the funeral home, mm -hmm. and they'd catch the bus and come back home. But they'd catch the bus on the on the street corner. And the police would stop those police cars and just say to four of you here, or five, say, uh, what you doing standing on the corner? So I'm waiting for the bus. You're loitering. Who's, who, who, well, we're going to save you. Well, let me see your car. Well, sometimes, you know, we tell it, bring you. I'll bring you that ID with bring you. you okay. Well, two would have it, other three wouldn't. Get in the wagon, let's go. And, and uh, again, uh, most of the people down in the court uh, house knew I was university dean at the time, and I'd go in a night coat. That's when they had night coat, and I'd go to get the guys. And when I'd go to sign them, they call them on my own recognizance to get them out of jail. The, the captain or somebody would come and sit and say, "Dean, uh, yeah, I've come to get my boy." I said, "Well, where are you?" And let me tell you what they did. Ah, uh, you know. That's not what the boys told me, and mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'll never get one night we were in night court, and the captain came. He sat next to me, and the judge would they go to the night court, you know, handle prostitutes and all that handle it. And, and they called the four guys and said, uh, "Come forward." They stood behind before the judge and says, uh, "You got a lawyer?" And they turned and say, "Yeah, we got a lawyer." And they pointed to me, and the captain said. No, 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 no. Dean, they don't want you. They want their lawyer. I said, I'm their lawyer. And she said, you are? I said, I can't thank you enough for everything you told me last night. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't true. And the judge would dismiss the case in the NLA. Uh, but uh, again, for me, it was, a, it, it, was, it was a joy to work and to do all of those things. And I did, I did a lot because I knew all of the males and people who asked me, J Joe, I don't think you were here when they wanted me to run for mayor. This is old, I was here. Oh, that's right, you've been here. Oh, I was here, I've been, I've been here, 30, I've been here 37 years. Oh, 
Moon Landrew was mayor, and Dutch followed him, Dutch Black Prison. Mm -hmm. And I went to I went to undergraduate school with Dutch and Xavier. And Dutch was, you know, Alpha. Moon was at Loyal, I went to law school with Moon. And so the two of them, well, nah, they they got along, but not a, all the time. And so they would say to me, tell your friend this. There you I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you, you can talk. Talk to him. But they wanted me to run for real. I, I guess I'd have won because they had all of that political party on this side and blacks on this side, I'd have won. And I looked at both of them, I said, you know, you must be crazy. I've got the best job in the city and you want me to go and I watched both of you for 16 years taking all this foolishness. I wouldn't have liked it. They said, well, you could do the job. I said, yeah, but I would not have, that's not my persona, no. And the, the, the other thing was, my wife was going to leave me if I didn't <laughs> run for mayor. I, I, I was clear about that, so I know I wouldn't run it for mayor. How do you envision Xavier in the future? Uh, Xavier, well, and that's a good question. I think two things. Xavier has to keep uh, its commitment to its uh, goals and objectives. Uh, you know what, Joe, get, get that for me, see that. That goals and objectives. And, and, and that is to take people like me, you, the rest, uh, who have much to offer the future and make sure that you get educated to the fullest, as we do. And we can't slip. We got to keep our standards high and we got to make sure that my, my model was, and before me, Everybody is somebody, mm -hmm. and everybody needs to be treated as somebody and made sure that you can help. That's not it's almost 75 percent of the numbers. Now it's down to about 24 percent. Black colleges are educating 24 percent of all blacks who go to higher education. But that number is still a high number. That if black colleges were not here, that group in that generation would not get educated. Mm -hmm. And so, and I reminded people, I said, the black colleges were founded in 1855. Right before I went on, they showed slavery and, and where slaves couldn't be taught to read and write all that. I said, so, uh, the, actually, actually uh, uh, African American Episcopal Church started, uh, I don't know whether it was Wilberforce. Morse Brown. Morris Brown, Morris, Morris Brown. Brown. <laughs> well, that's a hundred plus years ago, and I say we're still here. And 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 I and I said, and they told me you had three cameras. You, you, and I didn't have a teleprompter. The lady who was there was very good, African American. Uh, she, whenever she was talking, she looked at the camera because she had a teleprompter. Uh, when I had, when I spoke, I spoke to the camera over here at some time when she's not. The, and they said, if you want to talk to the public, that's the camera. So I had to remember now which one I'm going to talk to. And I looked at the camera at, right at the black college when I said, if there were not a black college in this country today, I wouldn't be here. I'd be out finding one, building one, because the future of, the, of this country is going to be the education of blacks. And it's going to be education. And I'm not suggesting all blacks should go to black colleges, not at all. We got to be out there like I was at Loyola because Loyola, Loyola's white students, guys, they all became the young Turks who with me helped change uh, uh, the city because they became the mayors and so forth. But the generation that is coming in the future is going to have to be both aggressive and smart and intelligent and knowing what to do when you have to do it. That's leadership and it's, it's called uh, it's just now trans uh, action, tra transformational leadership, where you are able to move from here to there with a leadership that's going to address the problems, mm -hmm. and and the quality of life issues. I give a lot of these talks. You can take housing, you can talk, take education, you can take medical, any quality of life issue uh, you can name. The gap between blacks and whites. Is like this, and it hasn't changed. Uh, 
Plessy versus Ferguson was the Louisiana separate but equal law. That became the law of the land in 1896. If they were not for black colleges, you know, I, my generation, I was not the only one, but we, we lost a lot of African Americans in higher education and the leadership because of separate but equal. Louisiana used to pay you to go get your graduate degree in any way you wanted to go to keep you from going and getting a graduate degree in Louisiana. You know, they broke that up, but there were all of these crazy things. And right now, it, it, what, where Xavier should be is, is where a lot of black colleges ought to be, closing that gap between those quality of life issues, dealing with poverty. The, the, the roadway out of poverty is education. And, and I, 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 the two things that I've said, there's going to be a revolution in this country, and it may come sooner than we think. I mean, what's going on in the country right now with the divisiveness out there and uh, the, the bigots who told in my generation, and they were uh, governors and all, they told poor white people that you're better than poor black people. And they, they kept us separate. But if we'd have got together, if the poor whites and the poor blacks had gotten in the streets and acted up, a whole lot of things, but it, it didn't. Because it's an old saying, you don't go bear hunting with a switch. And so in no way we would have been able to change things. With, so we had to get educate the AP tourists, the lawyers, and all the rest to change it legally. And then take advantage of it. And, and again, it's training leadership. I, Joe, I, you probably the only one in here is going to be able to finish this sentence. Uh, but in the early days, there was a famous slogan that said, "A voteless people is a hopeless people." Hopeless people. They learned that. <laughs> that was NAACP's <laughs> slogan. Yes. And right now, look at last night. Look at last night. I I was calling when I was driving with the lead back my son that said, what's the count in Pennsylvania, you know, yeah. and he's eyes closed, Daddy, so, oh my God, and it was, so, was but that was a big victory, and, it, and it's an obligation for black folks and black colleges to continue to say you got to vote, you can say what you want. Politicians know one thing, I want you to vote now, they might not tell you that, but they want it, and you keep it until you get somebody who's going to do right with it in the life. So that, that's, that's the second thing. Xavier's got to be involved in the community. And number two, we've got to make sure that young people don't see education as a passing fancy. You know, I'm going to go. That pulse of uh, perseverance mm -hmm. is a good story about those three guys because they tell it like it is, you know. Yeah. They didn't understand at first what it meant. Well, first of all, First of all, as they admit, they were some of the best in their high schools, and they did everything the high school asked them to do, but they didn't ask them to do enough. Mm -hmm. So they went to college. It was a different ballgame, and they all say that, oh, you know, I understand it, more world, mm -hmm. and you got to hang in there. Uh, and, and that's another future. I, I, I think in addition to providing uh, the education for medical workers, pharmacy, doctors, all the rest, teaching. I predict that teaching is going to be the best job you can get in the future. Now people go, oh, but they don't pay teachers enough. As an old economic theory, where there's a scarcity, you pay money to get it. And teachers are getting scarce in this uh, country, and we're going to have to put and pay them what we're paying athletes. And that's going to be a part of the future. And, 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 and Xavier can't miss that. And, and the leadership, uh, I should have said it earlier about, I had a great time, and Joe has heard me say this in faculty meetings. People ask me every day, uh, let, let me back up. You know the tenure of a black college president right, right now is about six years. Six years. Now, in the olden days, you know, maybe 15, yeah. 20. No, I don't think anybody will do the 47. Uh, that, that, the lady from Southern said, that'll never happen again. It may not. 
because right now this, the tenure for college presidents in the black community is about four, mm -hmm. four or five percent. I mean, there were five openings uh, two months ago. But, but right, that is, it's about eight. It, it, I don't know if they feel them all, but it's about eight. It was about eight college presidencies, black college presidencies open, like you said, a couple months ago. Yeah, well, well, Morehouse, to to death, of course, and, mm -hmm. and uh, they had, I think, four college presidents in the last three years. Yeah, right. Three years. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have to have stable leadership and sustainable leadership. And, and my old statement is, anybody who doesn't know the past is bound to repeat it in the worst way in the future. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say you don't, you don't live in the past, but you ought to know it in order to be prepared for what the future is. And Xavier cannot do is say, oh, that'll do, that'll do, that's all right. You don't have to do this or that. That happened in our earlier days when teachers, uh, and that's a, that's a form of racism too, you know. Oh, you don't have to do that. No, you got to do this. And that's what that pulse of perseverance is. And, and, and and there's some whites that say, well, you're too hard, you know, on those poor black kids. There ain't no poor black kids. Those kids want to learn. And, and we got to keep that going. And, and yes, I was like, I told you, A.P. Turo, he wanted to go to the courts to change the things. Uh, Martin Luther King and the rest said, no, we got to protest. Okay. But, but, don't, I would never let somebody say to me, we gonna let you get by. No, you're not doing me a favor. And I didn't get any favors. I, I had to do everything as I should. But as I say again with my presidency, the question said, well, how did you last that long? I said, it was easy. Joe, you heard me say it. I hired people smarter than me and I got out of the way.